Hi, uh, good afternoon, and thank you for attending another segment of This Week in Plymouth. Uh, my name is Derek Brindisi. I'm your town manager, and I'm also your host uh, for this, uh, this week's segment. So um, this week, I, I asked two of our um, town officials to join us. Uh, chief Foley is our fire chief, and Chad Hunter is our harbor master. And so the reason why I asked them to attend this week is because we've had a very busy weekend, actually kind of a crazy weekend. And so we always use these, this, uh, this time, this 30 minutes of time every week to try to inform the public, try to give them information, um, and try to dispel any rumors that are out there. And I often talk about you know, a lot of the misinformation or disinformation that is on Facebook. So you know, this gives us that opportunity to, to talk to about facts mm -hmm. and, and really what has transpired. So Chief, I think I'm going to start with you. Um, so this past weekend, it was a very busy time for not only yourself as a chief, but for the fire department, the men and women of the fire department as well. Can you kind of explain what had transpired this weekend and some of the lessons learned from that? Well, this weekend was, uh, you're correct, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about it and to share this information with the community. Um, we've noticed a, a general uptick in activity in our responses um, over the weekend. We've been looking at the, the Friday to you know, Monday morning uh, time slot as a, uh, a particular area of concern. And uh, this particular weekend was the busiest that we've had thus far. Um, unfortunately, uh, we had two large building fires that created a, a substantial loss for two families. Um, both, both homes are uninhabitable um, and uh, the family is gonna have to recover with that. Um, I do have to say that I'm extremely proud of the, of the, of the members of the Plymouth Fire Department, the, the men and women. Um, I've asked them to work extra hours um, to, to have additional manpower um, because I knew the heat wave was going to be here and uh, that was going to be very taxing. And uh, because of the particular you know, busy nature uh, that, we've been, that we've been seeing, um, they've been working a lot of extra shifts. So the fact that uh, we had two large building fires over, over the weekend uh, really hats off to them uh, that they were able to, to perform at the level that they did and the professionalism that they, they showed. Um, extremely proud as their chief to, to be able to um, be able to say that. So Chief, let's stick with that for a second. Uh, that really goes back to preparation. Uh, we'll talk in a couple of minutes about the cooling centers and the work that the fire department and emergency management around cooling centers and sure. preparing our community for that. But one thing I did notice um, this past week, maybe not this weekend, but there were other structure fires in other communities. And what I noticed is that you know, many of the firefighters, you know, they had to be transported from heat exhaustion. Mm -hmm. And to your point about preparation, uh, it seems like our, our team of uh, men and women fared well, even though we were in 90 degree weather, uh, extreme heat on top of having to fight these fires. Yeah, I mean, the, the gear that, uh, that, that we're wearing um, doesn't allow heat to escape, so it traps a lot of that heat in, you know, sweat. Um, plus the gear that we carry, the, the packs, the equipment that we have, um, knowing that that weather was coming, uh, you know, my administration, um, we put an extra um, additional, made sure that we had an additional um, company in service. Um, that could respond and cover stations and areas so that we could continue making our response to the community. Um, but that also allowed us to have the additional manpower on scene so that we could take people that were in critical roles fighting fires and, and overhauling and, um, you know, the, the work that we do. And we could take them off of that, send them over to uh, what we call our rehab centers mm -hmm. and uh, make sure that they have a chance to cool down, have their blood pressure checked, make sure that they're, they're physically doing well and they have the chance to rehydrate. So I think that was really key. Key in, in preventing a lot of heat-related injuries, and, and in the end, when you have that kind of manpower on on a fire scene, it also reduces the physical injuries that can occur as well because people are, have a chance to, to recover and they're they're not as tired and you know um, they're they're more sharp and able to perform better. Right. So again, you know, thank you to you and your team. That's you know really thinking forward of like how to prepare our men and women um, as they head into some of these busy weekends. Um, so let's just talk about the two structure fires. Unfortunately, uh, both buildings, I think, were engulfed by the time um, you, you even had one apparatus on scene. Um, and so those two buildings were lost. And I know that there's still, in a fire, there's still an investigation that's mm -hmm. taken place. Uh, but is there any, any information that you can share with our community on what they should be starting to think about? Again, it's very dry season. Mm -hmm. It's very hot, very humid out there. What can we start thinking about doing for preparation on our end? So uh, those are great questions. Uh, you're correct in that those two fires are still under investigation. So there's really nothing I can share at this time as far as what the cause was. 
Um, and they were, they were, they, they got a very good head start on us. And unfortunately, there was, we, we had, we were very limited in what we could do to kind of save the, the actual structure itself. Um, but there are some, some steps, especially during the weather we've been experiencing, that, that people can take to kind of reduce the chances of, uh, of, of seeing one of these fires, maybe not in the severity, but fires in general. Uh, since Friday till just a little while ago, uh, we responded to our 17th fire since Friday. And a lot of that has to do with uh, the dry season and the drought that we're, that we're experiencing. We're in a pretty significant drought at this point across this region. And when that happens, uh, you know, the, the areas, um, you have grasses that kind of die and dry out. Um, the mulch that are around people's homes um, mm. can become very combustible. And the, the hot winds that everybody's been kind of feeling, sometimes a relief, but at the same time, that can spread flame and, and, and get these fires going a little bit quicker. So. Um, you know, in the state of Massachusetts, there's actually regulations out there for commercial buildings that um, mulch is kept at least 18 inches away from any combustible surfaces of a building. Um, they re recommend they put down like pea stones or, or some kind of rock uh, to decrease the uh, um, uh, space between the mulch that could be burning and the building itself. Um, so that's, that's one thing people do is take a walk around your home and see if there's any combustible material around your home and pull it away at least 18 inches and periodically take a look at if you have some dead shrubberies or, or anything like that, they, you, you perform some, some maintenance around the home and get those out of there. Um, all it takes is one cigarette that isn't placed in a proper right. container dropped on the ground or you know a match that's light in a citronella candle that's dropped on the ground and you walk away can turn into a house fire pretty rapidly. Right. So those are all great tips. Again, you know, I hope folks can uh, can listen to our chief, can understand some of the things that they need to do around their home to try to prevent those fires. Uh, so it not only protects their home, protects the lives of the people living in the home, but it also ensures safety of our, um, the men and women of the fire department because that's one less fire they have to respond to. 100%. So, Chief, uh, before we, we move over to uh, Mr. Hunter, our Harvard Master, Last week, you and I were heavily engaged around thinking about what we need to do to prepare our citizens for this heat wave. Mm -hmm. and, um, you, and I know that um, you engaged our, our emergency management director mm -hmm. and put together a plan to ensure that our residents were safe if the time came that they needed some type of relief. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, you know, through your direction and, uh, you know, what, what you were looking for and what we had discussed in the past as far as being prepared for, um, uh, incidents like these and, and conditions like this. Um, we were able to, to work with um, uh, Community Services Director Barry de Blasio to identify uh, where our cooling stations or centers could be within town and then come up with a transportation plan for any of our uh, um, disadvantaged people or, or, or mm -hmm. um, you know, um, uh, population, a vulnerable population that may require some transportation. Um, so we identified the libraries as being some, the Center for Active Living. Uh, we also, during the week, we opened up the Emergency Operations Center, the community room down there as a cooling center. Um, and we made sure that we had staff on, on, at those locations, plenty of water. And we did some community outreach as well to get the word out that you know these, these places are open. If you need help, call us and, and we'll respond and give you a hand. Right, it's interesting because um you know, when I was having conversations with, you know, other town managers in, in other parts of the state, um, some would say, well, why do you need cooling centers? You have 350 ponds, you have a beach, mm -hmm. you know, you have a lot of places that people can get relief. But I think what they fail to realize, what you just mentioned, that the vulnerable populations, the homebound populations, you know, they're not going to go to the pond, they're not going to go to the beach. And so we need to ensure that we have, and I appreciate your efforts of pulling together a transportation plan so if those folks needed to get some relief, they could call free of charge. Mm -hmm. They could be transported to either the library or the Center for Active Living, and, and get that relief. And I can tell you, um, you know, if it's easy for us to say, you know, we're in, we work in air-conditioned uh, buildings all day long, but if you don't have air conditioning, you mm -hmm. have to. You really struggle with, you know, 90-degree weather for you know three days straight. So, and and I noticed that in Europe, I think it was Spain, they had over 2,000 deaths that were heat-related deaths. So, yeah. again, you know, strong work by you and your EMD for pulling that together. And 
and I and I don't know what the history's been with cooling centers in the past here in the community. I've only been here for six months now, but you know I would imagine that this is something that we'll continue to do uh, in future heat waves. Correct? Yeah, yeah. As soon as the uh, you know the, the heat advisories come out there, that we can forecast and see that it's coming. We have a plan in place that we'll be able to implement and and make sure that we can offer these same services. Um, it's very important, even if somebody's at home and they're contemplating whether or not they need to go. Uh, the fact that we are going to offer them that help if they need it is sometimes all they need just to, to have that, that peace of mind. Right. Yeah, thank you. That's great work. So we'll, I guess we can transition now. Um, Chad, your, you and your team has received a lot of local um, press, uh, but there's been some national press with some of the things that are happening over at Manment Point uh, relative to um, the whales, I think, that are feeding in the area. Um, and a lot of the spectators are coming in uh, to, to watch those wheels. So first, could you kind of give us all a backdrop of like the, the environment or what's happening down there, and then we can kind of talk about some of the necessary next steps. Sure, absolutely. Um, so we've had a very unique display, um, people being able to whale watch from shore at Manomet Point. Um, this has happened a couple of times over the last 10 years where we have a uh, number of bait fish that actually congregate in these uh, very dense schools uh, close to shore. Um, uh, probably about five years ago we had a similar setup in Warren's Cove um, and you know the, there was some viewing from the, the Rocky Point area but um, not really available to the public but um, I think what you're seeing is really uh, you know a, a, a great food web going on um, that you know, in some cases uh, hasn't occurred in, in the last like 30 years. Um, I think On the Water magazine actually said uh, the striper population and the fish that are being caught, the size of them, mm. uh, this is the best fishing they've had in the last 30 years. Um, so we have people traveling all over uh, to fish that one area. Mm. Um, we have commercial striped bass where, you know, the guys are doing it commercially as well. Um, so there's been a lot of activity. I've never seen the density of boats in one area uh, quite like that in my tenure with the town. Um, so we have that and obviously the, the, the bait fish bring the fishermen, um, but they also bring in whales. Um, so we've had uh, a really great display of a couple of humpbacks. I think um, at least one of them is a juvenile. Um, you know, feeding, breaching, um, really all the behaviors that you know, in a normal year, you'd have to go on a whale watch boat and you'd have to go 20 miles out to Stellwagen Bank to see this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, luckily enough from Manomet Point, I mean, you've seen the pictures and the videos that have come through, uh, comp really tremendous uh, shots. Um, but obviously, you know, we're dealing with that interaction and that's our, our major concern here. Um, you know, an interaction between a whale and a boat is uh, very rare and very unique. Um, and in the last week, we've had two. Um, one, you know, there was a, a paddle boarder that caught a shot of a, a whale bumping a boat. Um, and then obviously the, the most recent uh, where the whale uh, breached and landed on the bow of a boat. Um, you know, luckily nobody was injured. Uh, as far as we can tell, the, the whale wasn't injured by those interactions. Uh, but it's just a reminder of how, you know, these are wild animals. Um, their feeding, their behavior, uh, in that you know proximity to the, the boating public can be quite dangerous. So you you mentioned the um, the the I think what everybody is really talking about today is the whale that I guess fell on the bow of a boat, right? Sure. So I, and you mentioned the term <coughs> called breaching. Can you just explain to folks what the what breaching is? I think people think of yeah. breaching in different ways. Yep. Um, sorry, and and I you know full disclaimer. I grew up. My dad ran a whale watch boat, and as a oh, kid, right. I, I probably have a hundreds hundreds of trips under my belt. So um, got to know whales, uh, you know, from that perspective. But breaching or breach feeding is uh, basically when they lunge out of the water, and uh, in some cases, you know. Uh, their body will be partially exposed, and in some cases, the, the whole whale can come out of the water, depending on the velocity. Um, but really what they're doing here is they, they kind of corral the, the bait, uh, and then they're basically swimming through it at a fast rate of speed with their mouth open, feeding, getting as many fish as they can, and you know, with that upward trajectory and that movement, they'll actually come out of the water a bit. 
So that's what we'd refer to as breaching. So that's what they're doing. They're actually feeding when they're coming out of the Correct. water. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. And, and this was the the situation that just happened. I think it was on Saturday or Sunday. Where I think maybe it was Sunday where the the breaching occurred and then the animal hit the bow yes. of the boat. Yeah, that was Sunday at about ten in the morning. Um, you know, we had obviously. Uh, this has been going on for a couple of weeks now where the whales were feeding in amongst the boats. Uh, we had that one bump um, last week. Um, and so leading into this weekend, we knew it was going to be obviously a very bo busy boating weekend because of the heat. Um, so we strategically placed a boat down there to kind of keep an eye on the boat activity amongst the whales. Um, so we were down there uh, all day Saturday, uh, very early in the morning, Sunday through the day. Uh, just basically making sure nobody was harassing the whale. Right. Um, obviously, these are protected species under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, which is a federal act. Um, the town doesn't have the authority to enforce that federal act, but we've been working with our, our uh, state and federal partners uh, to make sure that that information is provided to them. Can, Chad, can we talk about that sh just for a few minutes? Because, again, you know, we, you know, this... This whole show is really to try to give the sure. correct information back to our community. And so one thing that I have noticed on social media is that, you know, I would say the vast majority of the residents and general public is concerned about the safety of the animal. And they, they think that the harbor master should be doing more. Can you explain what our authority is and isn't in, yep. in trying to protect these animals? Yeah, so uh, as mentioned, the, the town doesn't have the ability to enforce that Marine Mammal Protection mm -hmm. Act. Um, and very specifically in that act, um, the concern there is harassment. So uh, they're humpback whales, they're not northern right whales, which have different, a different set of protections. Um, but basically the rule of thumb is uh, people shouldn't be uh, chasing or uh, you know, approaching the whales within 100 yards. Um, but if they are stationary and sitting and a whale approaches them, uh, if they get within 100 feet of the boat, they're supposed to leave the boat in neutral. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to drive away. Uh, once the whale surfaces away from them uh, beyond 100 feet, then they would slowly leave the area. Um, the situation that we saw sort of unfolding is the majority of the people are sitting stationary, uh, just kind of floating around, um, you know, despite, you know, the density of boats, they're just kind of sitting there and that's probably a better situation than boats sort of racing through the area uh, because obviously with speed then they have a longer reaction time so if that whale surfaces in front of them you know there's uh, probably more likely going to be injury not only to people on the boat but the whale itself um, so we've been watching very closely like I said 90 to 95 percent of the uh, the boats in the area were engaged in fishing mm -hmm. um, and you know we we did have some onlookers but you know they were sitting stationary not chasing or cutting the whale off. Um, the real hard or the tricky situation with a whale is it's constantly moving. Uh, right. So it's never in one spot for too long. Uh, so the whale would surface in amongst the boats and then it would dive down and it would show up maybe, you know, 300 yards to the east where there were no boats. So instead of having people sort of race back and forth, creating a more dangerous situation, everybody was just kind of sitting uh, mm -hmm. where they were. Um, and then, you know, the whale would kind of surface out to the east and then it would come back and go through the boats again. So um, we, were, we were very carefully watching to make sure nobody was harassing the whale, uh, despite, you know, obviously from shore, seeing that density of boats. Um, you know, it's, it's not the best situation, but at, at the same point, they're, they're not violating that Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, so we've, we've had a lot of discussions mm -hmm. with our... Uh, state and federal partners, so Mass Environmental Police, the Coast Guard, and NOAA, as long uh, as well as the uh, Whale Dolphin Conservancy here in Plymouth. Um, we've been pushing the message uh, how people can boat safely around whales. So there's a website, seaspout.org. Uh, that's been the, the website that we've been pushing. Um, we just installed some signage at the boat ramp, uh, which has a QR code, which brings you to the website as well. I think it has six steps um, to prevent any, uh, you know, accidents with whales and on on a boat. So, um, our rule of thumb, what we've been saying is, do not approach within a hundred yards. Don't cut off the whale. Don't chase the whale. These are all behaviors that can could be considered harassment. Um, and then, you know, if that whale does come 
uh, within 100 feet, uh, you want to keep your boat neutral, uh, let the whale kind of get a little further away, and then you can slowly leave the area. And I know you mentioned that you've been working with state and federal partners. So you mentioned uh, United States Coast Guard, NOAA, uh, Mass Environmental Police, yeah. and then some other agencies. Um, and so are, are you guys working together to try to uh, educate both the recreational boaters and the fishermen out there as to everything you just described? How, how are you communicating that message to them? So absolutely, that's been the, the number one key here um, is, you know, awareness. Um, so we had a conference call late Sunday, another one this morning, and I think we have another one scheduled for 3 o'clock, um, really talking about how to get that message uh, out to boaters uh, the most efficient way. So most likely it's going to be signage, some boots on the ground, um, some of the, there'll be a, a number of different agency boats out in the area. Uh, possibly providing pamphlets or you know a, a, the same message and, and bringing them to uh, these these websites um, that are already existing. Um, so that that's key awareness. Um, I think you know seeing the video. I think this was also a, a very good reminder to people that these are wild an animals and there can be dangerous situations. So you got to be careful and, and mindful for your own safety as well. Right. Um, you know, luckily nobody was injured, but that could have been a, a very tragic event um, for the people on board. So uh, I, th I think right after that incident, you know, we saw a lot of kayaks and paddleboarders start to go back towards shore for good reason. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think awareness and, you know, different ways to get that message out to boaters is really going to be the focus here. Uh, if somebody is found to be harassing, you know, chasing the whale down or anything like that, that won't be tolerated. Right. Um, we'll work with our with our state and federal partners to make sure that those are investigated and, and possibly prosecuted. Um, so that that's going to be really the next our focus for this next week. Uh, we had commercial striped bass that opened Sunday, and that mm -hmm. will run through Wednesday. So uh, there's probably going to be quite a bit of activity down there, and we're trying to kind of coordinate with our, our our boat partners to make sure that at least there's one agency out there at any given time to to be able to sort of witness and, and relay that message to the boaters. So I, I think the bottom line for the public to know is that um, the harbor master and the, along with the Coast Guard and other state partners will be patrolling the area on a regular Correct. basis yes. to prevent the harassment, but at the same time educating everyone who's out there, whether the commercial uh, fishermen or the recreational uh, boaters, as to what the rules of engagement are around, Correct. you know, witnessing these boats. So, you know, I think that alone, I, I hope, will allay some concerns from the general public, because I know that was one of their concerns. So again, great work by you and your team, and thanks for pulling Thank that all together. So uh, as we started thinking about pulling this segment together, it was really <coughs> um uh, coming around of all the activity that happened this this past weekend, and I thought, well, let's have the harbor master come on first, and then the chief come on second. But then, as you brought up, Chad, uh, your worlds collided this morning. So we thought, okay, we might as well bring you on together because um, there was there was another fire this mm -hmm. morning. Except this time, it was on one of our. Um, uh, recreational boats, for lack of a better term, one of our tour boats, what would you call it? Uh, it's the Captain John. Captain John's yeah. boat. So um, maybe, Chief, I'll go to you first. Oh, no, man, actually, Chad, let's go to you first because you were probably out on the water when this when this thing first broke and kind of explain to folks sure. what had happened. So we uh, we were actually down at Manamat Point uh, watching the whales and the boating activity, and uh, there was a call that was placed um, for a Captain John uh, vessel that uh, had a fishing trip on board. Uh, and they experienced a fire and were able to extinguish that fire, but uh, they were, um, the engines uh, ceased to, to operate, so they were awaiting a tow. They had uh, 54 people on board, um, so we ended up scrambling the, the boat from uh, Manomet Point to get onto their location, which was about uh, two miles east into Cape Cod Bay from Duxbury Beach, um, just kind of northeast of Garnet. Um, so we were able to get on scene and, you know, then the next concern is, all right, if we have to evacuate uh, the boat, we need, mm -hmm. we need more platforms here to be able to handle the, the number of people. So um, made sure our Coast Guard sector was involved, um, you know, make sure, I, I think there were a couple of resources actually stationed situate that was coming down to Manamet Point anyway. I know we had Mass Environmental Police uh, coming up from the canal. Uh, heading to the Whitehorse Beach area, so 
we already had some uh, assets sort of en route and just kind of gave them an update to say, hey, actually we have this going on, you know, can you stop there first? Um, so we we're able to get some assets on scene. Uh, the conditions out there in the bay were uh, not very favorable for mm -hmm. transferring people. Uh, we probably had, you know, two to three foot chop, um, which, you know, kind of make the, the boats won't sort of line up and they're uh, moving erratically. So um, everybody stayed on board. They had their life jackets on. Um, and then uh, there was a, a boat out of Plymouth Easterly that was towing uh, the Captain John and Son back. Um, Plymouth Fire uh, came out with, with their boat to meet up with us. Um, I don't know if it was about the Gurnet area um, and kind of escorting uh, in. Uh, we had a number of uh, towboat and boat US that were escorting us in as well. Um, and you know, once we got back to the pier, got the passengers off, off the boat, um, Plymouth Fire went onto the boat and inspected and they found you know, uh, material still smoldering, which I'll kind of turn it over to you at that point. But um, you know, just uh, it was a, a great partnership coordination effort. Um, obviously, again, it turned out really well, uh, all things considered. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Neil. So th this, this goes back to that preparedness, you know, mm -hmm. and being ready for, for anything that, uh, you know, we might encounter in the, in the town of Plymouth for emergencies. Uh, thankfully, we have a fantastic platform, a 33-foot fire boat uh, that allows us to not only move uh, quickly on the water, but also move water quickly mm -hmm. uh, so that if there is a fire, we, can, we, can, we have a monitor on there that'll, that'll um, provide a, a good, good amount of water. Uh, to be able to, you know, extinguish some fires, whether it be on pier or on a boat. Um, so once we received the call from um, the harbor master that there was a boat that had had a fire, um, we started our response out there. Um, we coordinated with the harbor master for the location. Uh, we responded out, evaluated the situation. Um, um, the crew had experienced the fire on board. They saw a uh, fire in the engine room. They used some extinguishers that they, that they had on board. Uh, to knock the fire down and then closed up the en engine compartment and contained the fire to the engine compartment. Um, when, the, when the boat was brought um, to Plymouth Harbor and our crews got on board, we found uh, fire still actually mm. active in, in there. Uh, we sent a crew down there, we extinguished the fire, and um, currently um, uh, we're working with the Coast Guard to, to investigate that fire. Um, the last report that I had is that we evaluated six of the crew members and transported two of them to the hospital for evaluations. Wow. So uh, again, you know, both your worlds collided after a very busy weekend for, for both your departments. So it was strong work. You'd say 54 um, passengers and plus their crew. So I'm not sure how big their crew is. So again, thank you both and your teams for all the work that you do for the town of Plymouth. But unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I said this would go quick, and it did go quick. Did. So. I just want to thank uh, everyone for uh, participating and, and listening into this segment because I, I found it very valuable. So uh, if you want more information, uh, please go to our website at www.plymouth-ma.gov. Uh, we will post regular information uh, as it becomes available, both uh, with the wheel and any other future events that uh, are related to the work of uh, town business. So uh, thank you all very much.